And now we are going to start. Uh, my name is Luz Maria Vergara, and I'm re re researcher at the Faculty of Architecture at Delft University of Te Technology. So welcome all, and thank you for attending our, our second event of the Urban Thinkers Campus titled The New Urban Normal, Urban Sustainability and Re Resilience Post-COVID-19. And I will give you some context about this event. Uh, it is or, or organized by the Faculty of Architecture and the Global Urban Lab in partnership with the World Urban Campaign. And this is um, the UN, UN Habitat plan, platform in charge, in charge of pro promoting the implementation of a new urban agenda. And um, for those that don't know, the Urban Thinker Campus are instrumental platform for stakeholders to get to, together in order to make decisions about implementing the new urban agenda. And we put in this chat, chat bot here the link to the World Urban Campaigns where you can find a complete overview of all UTCs. And the event, this, this event it, it itself is or, organized. Uh, uh, can you change the slide, uh, please? And yeah, thank you. The next one. One more. <laughs> thank you very much. So this uh, event it itself is uh, organized by the Global Urban Lab, uh, which is a, a program under the umbrella of Tilder Global. We are a communication and action platform that brings visibility and articulation to staff and students working on topics of urbanization in the global south or as we also say underrepresented ge geographies and the links to our websites is also in the chat, chat box and i just want to say that the last week we had our, our first uh, utc event and it was about cities in the glo global south and we have guests from Kerala, Sao, Sao, Sao Paulo, Minsk, and San, 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 Santiago or, of Chile. And if you, you miss it, uh, we recorded the uh, event, so you can also find that in the link in the chat box. And now I leave you with Roberto, who will con continue uh, pre presenting our uh, speakers in this particular event. Hi guys, uh, hi everyone. Uh, very welcome, very warm welcome. Uh, we are in the Netherlands and it's, uh, it's six o'clock here in the afternoon. It's still quite sunny. Um, but uh, we are very happy to have a growing audience. There are more and more people joining us. Uh, this is part of a series of three events, as Luz Maria has uh, pointed out. And this is the second time we organize uh, Urban Thinkers Campus. The first time we organized a, an Urban Thinkers Campus was uh, two years ago when we wanted to discuss how to teach the new urban agenda. And uh, there is a, a report uh, about that discussion and uh, how, how are we approaching the teaching of the new urban agenda. And it's available on issue. Um, if you go to our website or I think in the chat box, you will also find a link. But um, uh, today we are, it's a very special day for us because we got really very nice uh, speakers who are going to talk to us about the different green deals that are popping up. Uh, we have a very, a very big uh, new, new green deal, which is the European green deal uh, uh, that is being um, launched. But we have uh, several initiatives in the UK and so forth which we are going to, to, to discuss today. So uh, our first speaker, uh, speaker and I'm, I'm, I'm just going to, to, to uh, present them very quickly now, but I'm going to introduce them uh, uh, in depth later. Sander Happertz, um, I hope I, I pronounce it correctly, is a policy analyst on sustainable growth at the European Commission Directorate uh, General Regional and Urban Policy, which is the branch of the European Commission that uh, deals with spatial planning. Robert McGowan, uh, who is policy advisor and writes on green politics and economics. Uh, Julian Siravo is an architect and urban designer, and he's working at the UK-based uh, Commonwealth think tank, um, a think tank. And today we are moderated by uh, my dear friend and a very uh, 
uh, ubiquitous urbanist, uh, Constanza Lamantia, uh, talking to us directly from Johannesburg. Uh, she is technical advisor to, to the Rwanda Housing Authority and Rwandan Minister of Infrastructure for the World, World Bank. So uh, the general organization is done by Anya van der Watt. She is uh, uh, controlling everything and the slides and so on. And uh, we are a big group, but uh, the people here today are Anya, Luz Maria, who talked to you, Igor Pessoa, he, he is also here, and Car Caroline Newton, also talking to us from uh, Belgium. So, uh, Caroline, would you, talk, uh, would you like to talk about the third episode of the UTC that is going to happen? Thank you, Roberto. So, yes, uh, after this, we have a, a third episode, and this will take place on 13th of July. 6 p.m. Amsterdam time. And we have uh, a, a very nice lineup, let's say. Uh, we start with Julio Davila, who is the director of the Bartlett's Development Planning Unit. And he will start by questioning the assumed link between rapid urbanization and the emergence of zoonotic diseases. And he will try to enrich this debate by including the effects of structural drivers such as poverty and inequality and their spatial embeddedness. Next, Caroline Skinner, Director of Urban Research at WIGO and Senior Researcher at African Center for Cities, will discuss some important lessons that we need to take away from the current crisis with regards to the informal economy, and especially the need to provide space for this informal economy. And then furthermore, we will aim to look at the effects of COVID-19 on urban life in a number of African cities. Esther Karanya will speak from her experience in Nairobi, and then we have Emitopi Ogumba, Mila, and Tengo Dikyu, members of the Nigerian Slum and Informal Settlements Federation in Lagos and Port Harcourt. They will talk about the importance of the Corona Diaries project they are part of. So that is for the 13th of July, but first I think um, now we should uh, look Go at back to our program. Yeah, so uh, I hope you, you guys understand the, our logic. In the first uh, edition, we did a more uh, general uh, uh, approach towards the Global South, looking at four cities in the Global South. Today, we are talking a little bit more from, Euro from an European point of view and the, the Green New Deal. And um, uh, in two weeks, we are going to talk about, focus more on Africa, but also other countries in the Global South. But now for our first speaker, uh, Sander Hapartz, is a policy analyst on sustainable growth at the European Commission Directorate General Regional and Urban Policy. As I said before, he is responsible for environmental and climate issues and works with other commission services to integrate environmental objectives into cohesion policy investment across the EU. The EU. Before joining the commission, Sander worked as a researcher, a manager and lecturer on sustainability transitions and environmental policy at KU Leuven in Belgium. So uh, over to you, Sander, uh, if you want to say a few more words and uh, share your screen. Uh, th thank you very much for the um, excellent introduction. Uh, so hello, everyone. I'm very happy uh, to be here with you uh, today. I am going to show, yeah, this, so can everyone see my presentation? Yes, okay, great. So as uh, Roberto very nicely introduced me, I work for the European Commission, the uh, part that deals with the regional and urban policy. Um, as I will explain, this policy, so we call it regional policy or cohesion policy, it's the same thing. It is mainly an investment policy. Huh? So we, we uh, more or less manage uh, one third of the EU budget that goes directly to member states, regions and cities in, in the form of investments. And what I do is to uh, make the link with those investments, between those investments and the EU's uh, environment and climate policy. And so today I will talk to you about the European Green Deal which, as you uh, may know, is the one of the six main political priorities of the fairly recent uh, von der Leyen Commission. It's the first uh, of those priorities. And what it is, is that it basically, 
It has a headline target that is to make Europe the first climate neutral continent by 2050. But in order to do so, it uh, deals with many different things. And, and on this slide, it sort of summarizes the main uh, program of the next five years of this commission. Um, so uh, the commission will initiate and is already doing so a number of um, strategies, but also uh, proposals for new legislation to make this uh, climate neutrality happen. So it is, of course, about energy, uh, where we will, for instance, initiate a, a very big renovation wave of houses to save energy, but also uh, take several initiatives to boost renewable energy, the hydrogen economy. It is also about industry and circular economy. So the Commission already adopted in March a new circular economy action plan, which is uh, very ambitious. It is also about um, having a zero pollution ambition. Uh, so we are now working across the Commission on a new action plan that is about air quality, water quality, uh, noise pollution uh, and soil quality with the ambition of being pollution free. We have in May adopted a new biodiversity strategy which aims to protect one third of the European territory. Uh, in terms of being a protected area uh, and it has a number of other very interesting elements for cities for instance the commitment to uh, have each city in Europe uh, adopt an urban greening plan which I think for urban thinkers is something very interesting so if you don't know this I, I suggest that you take a look at the EU biodiversity strategy. There is a farm to fork strategy, there are a number of initiatives related to mobility uh, so all of this is something that the Commission will uh, start doing in the next five years and then of course as EU policy works we have to work with the member states with the Parliament uh, to make this happen. Sander, uh, people are saying that uh, they can see a kind of uh, they can't see the whole slide. It's probably because you have the chat box on top of the slide, maybe. Aha! So if yeah. I do it like this, is better. Uh, no. Uh, uh, how can I uh, like this? Ah, yeah, that's a little bit better, but we still see a, a little a little box at the bottom. Uh huh. Okay. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> but I, well, I'm sure. Will you share the slides later with the people? Yes, they will. May, they will be available. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I I, I don't see this box, so I don't know how to uh, get rid of it. <laughs> um, I don't want to talk too much about the the proposals that the Commission adopted a couple of weeks ago uh, in terms of the EU budget. Um, but there, this is called the Recovery Plan for Europe, um, and. As you know, the EU budget works in seven year cycles. The next, next cycle is uh, su supposed to begin in 2021. And the commission had adopted already a proposal for this new budget two years ago, but there is still no agreement among um, member states and parliament on this new budget. And so a couple of weeks ago, the commission um, in responding basically to the COVID crisis adopted a new EU budget, which is larger. And uh, what I want you to just uh, take away uh, of this is that it has basically three elements. The first element was really the immediate response to the crisis. So there have been a number of initiatives to help member states um, with their labor market and with their health sector. But in the future, we are, I mean, there, there have also been proposals to really repair the damage that the COVID crisis has done. So already still within current ongoing programs, there is uh, additional money um, because, for instance, we see that city budgets are going uh, down because of a lack of income from local business and that means that planned cycle paths or waste management projects were stopped. So the EU budget will now help making these project pipelines uh, going back on track. But the real recovery from the crisis is what we aim to do with the next EU budget. And this is the proposals that you heard a lot about in the press and uh, which will also be discussed by the European Council, so state leaders uh, next July. And what I want you to, to know as well is that the um, ambitions of the Commission especially in terms of uh, the European Green Deal, but also the digital uh, transition, remain center stage also for these new, um, these new proposals for the next EU budget. 
Now, I am coming now to a cohesion policy. So, um, if, if you want to, because I see there is somebody knocking, do you need to answer the door? <laughs> yes, I, this, this looks a lot like, you know, this scene from this guy who was talking about North Korea on CNN. Um, <laughs> so, I have indeed one of my three kids coming in. Um, just hold on a second, please. That's fine, that's fine. We all understand. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, so I have to start sharing again, I guess. Yes. So how are we gonna make this all happen? Because basically there is no lack of money. The EU budget, uh, at least what we have proposed, is quite significant. So uh, we know that, and we have said in the European Green Deal that there are a lot of investment needs uh, for the green transition. There, the, there is no lack of money, but it's really how are we going to make it happen? This is the main question that we are working on, that we have to um, think about now because the COVID crisis has changed everything. Um, so how are we going to make this green transition happen with the investments that are available for basically, let's say, the coming 10 years? Because our aim is really to use the next budget cycle, uh, not only to think about 2027 or 2030, but to really uh, help regions and cities in um, for, yeah, achieving actually the 2050 um, objectives. And in cohesion policy, in in, in the work of me and my colleagues, we are dealing with the situation of territorial diversity on the ground. So here, for instance, on this slide, you see um, electricity generated from hard coal and lignite on the left and electricity generated from renewable sources on the right. So for the energy transition, not all regions in Europe are starting from the same point. This is uh, very important uh, to take into account. On this map, you see that the impacts of climate change are being felt across Europe, but they are actually quite differently felt across Europe. This is also something that we need to think about because climate change adaptation is also one of the priorities of the European Green Deal. Here you see uh, a statistic on waste management. So whereas the Netherlands or or uh, the region of Flanders in Belgium has very high recycling. There are still several member states in the EU who are still landfilling most of their waste. So if we think about achieving a circular economy, we need to take this diversity in, uh, in a, into account as well. What we also see, for instance, on this slide is that the uh, environmental impacts and also the impacts of climate change are hitting the poorest hardest. So this is not only in, at the scale of a city, where it's also true that very often the poorest neighborhoods have the highest uh, levels of air pollution, noise pollution, but it is also true at the European scale. So here, for instance, on this slide, it may not be so visible, is, but it's just an example. The exposure to particulate matter uh, overlaps to a significant extent with the less developed regions of the European Union. So this is where cohesion policy comes in. As I said, cohesion policy is a policy that basically mobilizes one third of the EU budget through the different funds that you may have heard of in the Netherlands, for instance, uh, you know, the European Regional Development Fund or EFRO. Uh, on, in the poorest uh, countries in Europe, there is more the cohesion fund. We have also, as part of the European Green Deal, proposed a new just transition fund. All these funds form part of cohesion policy and we negotiate uh, with the European, at the European Commission programs with regions or member states, it, it depends on the country, on um, uh, which kinds of investments will be um, funded with this money to make changes happen on the, on the ground. Cohesion policy invests in everything, in research and innovation, in uh, digitalization, in environment, in climate, in climate change adaptation, in um, uh, risk prevention, in uh, schools, in hospitals, in basically everything. But we do it uh, with place-based programs. We have programs 
per region where we have an integrated approach on the development of that region. It has uh, specific elements for cities as well, including the urban agenda for the EU that I don't know to which extent you are familiar with it. It's a bit the, the EU um, part of the new uh, global urban agenda. Um, and it's in shared management. This means that when we have negotiated programs with member states, it's basically the member states or the regions that also that decide on the projects that they are actually funding. This is not something that happens in Brussels. It's something that happens uh, on the ground. I just want to show you two examples of projects that we are funding. Um, and you, you should imagine that we are funding millions of different projects like this. This is a, a project from the Netherlands, which is why I'm showing it today. Uh, so here we um, supported a project by the University of uh, Twente, which was which had developed already a new membrane to remove certain pollutants from drinking water and the investment helped to commercialize this uh, new project so that it can be scaled up. Um, and this is now already used for, uh, for instance in, in Twente where uh, wastewater with this new um, uh, material can be reused as drinking water. So this is one example in the Netherlands. Obviously, the Netherlands is a highly developed um, member state. This means that the funds that it gets from cohesion policy are quite limited. So um, we, the, the, it's important to know that for cohesion policy um, has investments in all regions in Europe, but the amounts are much, much bigger in the less developed parts of Europe. This is a second example, which is not one specific project, but rather to show that, for instance, in the Ruhr region in Germany, which was, which is one of the oldest industrialized regions of, of Europe, um, where uh, decades of cohesion policy investments have really accompanied this region, to help turn the, the deindustrialized areas into basically a, a green metropolis. So there are a lot of uh, projects there on urban greening, on a, a cycling network, uh, all kinds of things, turning formal steel sites into lakes with recreation, etc. And this is really an example of what cohesion policy does. So it's not about individual projects, but it's really about integrated development of a city and of a region um, and to really accompany the transition. And this, I wanted to show this because this is also how we see our support, the support of cohesion policy for the European Green Deal. It's really to accompany regions and cities in the long-term transition towards sustainability um, that is basically embodied by the European Green Deal. Uh, this is just a quote from uh, President von der Leyen in her political, uh, sp her first speech basically to the to the parliament and, and this shows really what cohesion policy uh, does as well. Uh, we will invest, and this is the example that I gave from the Netherlands, in place-based innovation. Uh, the, the example from the Netherlands is not by coincidence on water. This is one of the priorities that the Netherlands has for their innovation and this is uh, therefore also why we support this topic in the Netherlands. But it is also about really deploying on a massive scale uh, all these technological innovations, but also social innovations. So um, we use our funding and especially in those areas where there is a lot of funding to really start deploying all of these innovations. The policy is also there to facilitate the phase out of unsustainable practices. I'm not I don't have the time to give you the details of uh, our uh, regulation for the next period, but one of the elements is that we are completely, that we proposed to completely um, exclude investments in fossil fuels in the least desirable forms of, of waste management. So it's really to start um, helping regions because not for all regions it's easy to go for a circular economy, to go for climate neutrality, but to really help also those industries, the people who have jobs there to phase out of these unsustainable practices. And I give the example of the new proposal for a just transition fund. It's really ensuring a just transition for all regions that no one is left behind. This is one of the key principles of the European Green Deal and it's one of the key tasks of uh, cohesion policy. Um, looking at the time, I think I should probably stop. This is actually my last slide. This was just to highlight a number of the specific urban initiatives that we have in our proposals for the policy in, in the next uh, generation. I can probably talk a little bit more about that if there are any questions. Um, the urban agenda for the EU will be succeeded by what we call the European Urban Initiative. Um, 
perhaps just take away from this slide that obviously the, the policy is being spent to a very large extent in urban areas, but there are also a number of initiatives, this is what this slide shows, that uh, really go directly to cities, meaning that it's also the cities who have the control over, over the money. So I can talk about that a bit more if there are questions, but in order to keep the schedule, I will stop here. I will make the slides available and these are my contact details if you want to get in touch with me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sander. Uh, uh, Costanza, uh, do you want to take over or uh, because we thought the questions would be at the end, right? So af after yeah, the... I think it would be more interesting to listen uh, also, you know, the different yeah. perspective and then have collective yeah. questions. We had, we had a very special presentation because of, obviously, you know, uh, the European Union is gigantic and very uh, mighty, so to speak. So, um, and uh, I think we are now going to listen to our friends from the UK. Which um, unfortunately is no longer part of the European Union. But, yeah, exactly. Uh, okay, I think uh, maybe we should not mention Brexit too much. <laughs> no, it's too late, you already have. I'm not going to make any Brexit jokes, but um, Robert McGowan uh, is going to speak now. He is a policy uh, advisor and writes on green politics and economics. He is formerly policy development coordinator for the Green Party of England and Wales, and he sits on the core group of Greenhouse Think Tank. He is also an, organize, an organizer with the Green New Deal uh, UK. He has a master in governance and economics by the University of, of Leiden here in the Netherlands. So over to you, Robert. Great, thank you very much. I will just get my slideshow started. Brilliant, well, thank you very much for having me. Um, uh, as Roberto said, I studied my master's in, in, in Leiden. Um, so it would have been really nice to say uh, it's lovely to be back here in the Netherlands, but such is life under COVID, um, and, and this is more sustainable than anyway, so, so that's fine. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, the Green New Deal. Um, some say it's quite uh, malign uh, as, a, as a concept, but I'll come on to the various separations that are floating around um, about the Green New Deal. Um, but it's important, first of all, for me that we, we get right at least from my perspective, and I'm speaking here as an activist from Green New Deal UK principally, is that we, we get it right as Green New Deal. And that's for us, the, all three are important. Without the Green, of course, it's not made in the 21st century. Without the New, it's the same. Can you still hear me? Yeah, there is a problem with echo uh, when you're speaking. Uh, okay. Um, maybe I can move my screen towards me. Yeah. Maybe. Is that any better? That that sounds better. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. Should I repeat anything, or had, was it okay up to there? It's 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 okay. It's okay. Okay. Fine. Okay. Um, so without the new, as I said, it's the same deal as before. So the old terms of agreement, you could say, in a green font. And without the deal. Uh, it's only one party involved and not multiple, and that's really important. And also Green New just doesn't make grammatical sense, so that would be silly. I'm also coming from a UK perspective. Uh, I'm a volunteer, like I said, with Green New Deal UK. Um, so as well as explaining the Green New Deal as a concept, these slides in particular are going to go through what we do as an organisation. Um, they're directed at introducing audiences in the UK to an organisation and what we try to do. So it's almost like a bit of a pitch. But I hope you'll understand that I think it's a, it's a good insight into how that type of um, work functions. And even it's just as a model for perhaps uh, gleaning some insight from or, or perhaps applying to other places. Um, the Green New Deal uh, uh, as a concept uh, is nothing if not internationally minded though. And so while I'm talking about the UK, even our work is, is, is really internationally minded. Um, I think it's pretty obvious as to why. And I should say there's also a campaign called Green New Deal for Europe, which you can check out. They have um, one of the best short videos I've ever seen about the, the Green New Deal. I think it's brilliant. And I'll put it in the chat after. And there is also uh, recently launched a, an organization called uh, the Global Green New Deal, which um, would, be, uh, would be useful for, for people to have a look at. So let's go to the next slide. Hmm. 
Just trying to move to the next slide, sorry. Sorry, there we go, okay. So what is the Green New Deal? It's difficult to put in a line, but for us, it's a, an ambitious 10 year national action plan to transform our economy, secure a livable climate and build a more just society. But to break that down, we need to look at the context. And so again, coming from a UK perspective, but I think the political moment that we find ourselves in, it, uh, in right now, um, this applies in many places to simultaneous crises, the climate crisis and the crisis in inequality. And those issues are, they're, they're huge. They, they, they underpin so much of the political debate that happens right now in, in, in countries and around the world and in an international context. Um, and so the solutions must be too. There's no time for tinkering around the edges here. And that's why we do what we do. So I would say the climate impacts that people have talked about aren't, as it, aren't felt as immediately as the COVID impacts that, that stimulated this emergency reaction. Um, and yet in many places around the world, they are felt right now. In many places in the UK and Europe, as you can see from those pictures, they are felt right now. And indirectly, they're felt in the policies that governments introduce. So when you look at the type of green policies that have been promoted in some countries, they are green in hue. But in terms of the, the benefit that they bring to people, sometimes it's not there. And that's the really important thing that the Green New Deal, is, that the Green New Deal seeks to take account of. And that's why the deal element is in there. That's why the new element is in there. So the principles, again, for us as an organization, these are, these, this is what we do to, to hold anything that calls itself a Green New Deal to account. One, totally decarbonize the UK economy in a way that enhances the lives of ordinary people, workers and communities to eliminate social and economic inequality. And then, like I said at the start, this is a 10 year program. So we don't necessarily have a net zero date, but Again, I think that the, the, the net zero debate has been going for years and um, it's not necessarily about that anymore. The immediate priority is to reduce emissions fast now. If we had to start reducing emissions 10, 20 years ago, we could have done that 2 3% per year. Things might have been not so bad. But right now, it's a 7% reduction every single year from now through to 2050, and that's globally. So rich nations, countries with a history of uh, emitting more CO2, they need, to do, they need to go even faster than that. Second principle, create millions of well-fed, secure, unionized jobs across the country, guaranteeing healthy and fulfilling livelihoods for all workers, communities, including those in today's high emission sectors. What this speaks to is the idea of a just transition. So this isn't about fetishizing work. Uh, it's, it's not about getting rid of people who are doing work in high carbon industries. It's about finding a way to put work where it's needed, and there are many, many places where it is needed, but also to make sure that work is good quality. And for us, that might mean um, that, uh, for me, certainly it, it means reducing hours. That's a really big part of it. That was a part of the consideration of the, the original Green New Deal in the 1930s, but it never made it through into, into the plans that, they, um, that uh, Roosevelt introduced. Um, but for us, that's key. And that's key to modern lifestyles as well, and, and also to a lot of the work we want to do to try and reduce ecological footprints individually and systemically. Third principle, transform our economy so that the financial system serves the needs of people on the planet. I'm going to go into the history in, 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 a, in a minute, but you'll see that the original Green New Deal plans in 2008 that started in, in, in London, in the UK, they were really finance focused and they really got at this idea that, there, that the, the mass of resources in, in, the, in modern uh, economies is directed at unsustainable uh, uses. And, that, and that's a key problem that we're never going to be able to tackle without dealing with the financial system. Our economy must work for everyone with greater democratic participation, accountability, and common ownership. Fourth principle, protect and restore vital habitats and carbon sinks, including forests and wild areas, ensure the provision of clean air, clean water, air, green spaces, and a healthy environment for all. The key thing here, I think, is making it protect the environment by design. It might be easy when we're trying to transition to a low carbon economy to have the you know 
the actual green bit as a bit of an afterthought. It can't be that way. We've got to think about this when we have these big infrastructure product projects that are needed to transition and that we that we would support that create these really good unionized jobs. At the same time, they have to be infrastructure projects that will damage the, the environment around us. And the fifth principle, promote global justice by supporting all peoples and countries to decarbonize and ensuring the UK does its fair share to account for historic emissions and exploitation of resources and communities. Again, like I said, it's absolutely central to the Green New Deal. The Green New Deal can be a national plan only. It's got to be a national plan with an international mindset. So a very brief bit on history. The original New Deal, like I said, the 20th, 20th century version without the green. Um, actually, I'll say one quick thing about the, 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 the uh, principles. What does that look like? I, Julian is going to come on with that in the, in the next talk because he's working in the think tank world. Green New Deal UK is an organization we're building in Luton. That's our plan. And so while we've set out these principles, that defines a lot of the policy that fits in under that. It doesn't determine them. Um, and we want to keep some kind of flexibility. We want to keep also some sense of democratization of what happens here. We want to make sure that people have a stake in, in the plans that are uh, put forward. Uh, and so we, we're not uh, focusing on being a policy organization. And the other thing I would say that taking these principles, you get a sense of what things don't count as a green new deal. And I don't want to, uh, we, we might come on to this in the questions, but you know, the, the European Green Deal seeks to mobilize, not spend, mobilize 1 trillion euros. In the UK, some of the plans for a Green New Deal in the UK have sought to, to spend that amount of money over a decade just for the UK, not for the entire European Union. So that gives you a sense of the scale. In terms of composition, there are also massive differences between some of the plans that come up. And so we see these principles as really, really important. Is it radical? Yeah, but that's what the um, that's what the circumstances we find ourselves in demand. So the history. There's a red line that's entered my screen. I don't know where that came from, but thank you for that. Um, President Roosevelt uh, enacted a Green New Deal in response to the Great Depression originally. Um, there are solid criticisms of that plan, but in principle. The, the rolling up of sleeves of government, the identifying where public goods exist and directing resources towards them is the critical element. And that's why we take inspiration from that deal. But there were many, many weaknesses in terms of institutional racism, the lack of democratization in that plan. Uh, it was material and consumption driven in many ways. Um, and so we basically learn from that and build on it, but, but, but not, not be tethered to it. In 2008, the idea of a Green New Deal was put forward by economists and thinkers in the UK. Um, these included Anne Pettifor, they included Caroline Lucas of the Green Party, Larry Elliott, uh, the economics editor of The Guardian, um, and, and, and many others. Um, we see the, the, the big weakness, or, or yeah, the big weakness of, of that program, that really exciting program at that time that laid the groundwork for a lot of what happens now, as failing in terms of uh, the, the organization, the movement that was behind it. And in 2008, you had a group of thinkers, you had some op-eds, you had some really exciting ideas that were very fit for the, for the time that they came that they came about it, but that did not have a mobilized group of people powerful enough to see them introduced. And that is, that is the, the problem that we seek to solve in our work. In 2018, really, the credit has to go to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, to the Sunrise Movement in the US, a bunch of uh, young uh, climate activists, climate justice activists, who picked up the idea of the Green New Deal, put it front and center in AOC's plan, and, and uh, have, have championed it ever since, and really built the imagination for what it looked like, and almost brought it back to the UK, because a lot of people in the UK saw that happening across the Atlantic, so wow, that's the kind of thing that we need to be talking about as well. And that really invigorated a lot of what's happened in the UK ever since then. So as an organization then, what's our plan? Where do we fit into all of this stuff that's happening? For us, it's about building a powerful, broad-based, representative social movement that builds and maintains the social and political conditions to deliver a transformative Green New Deal. And I should say that doesn't stop when a government that says it supports a Green New Deal enters government, there's been a, you know, 
instance after instance where governments who say that they're going to do something don't have the political pressure to make them do it, to keep them doing it, to do it in, in the most ambitious way that they can do it. Um, and, and the things that happen as a result. And so our, our role is to create that movement and, and drive it to the hilt for the next 10 years and onwards. And what will be the outcome? Deliver a government committed to and beginning to deliver a Green New Deal, but to continue championing that, like I say, for the next decade and beyond. So how do we do that? Our analysis is that we need three things. Organised youth, organised workers, and organised communities. In the UK, there's been a really inspiring, and I should say all, all around Europe, all around the world, there's been a really inspiring youth movement uh, with climate justice again uh, front and centre. Um, Greta Thunberg was, was the initiator of the Fridays for Future movement, but there have been so many other um, uh, movements that have come about since then. They've been really powerful in forcing people to take on the responsibility as, as, as adults for what kind of uh, planet related to future generations and what kind of position we're putting people in right now. And so that's a really, really powerful movement um, that's been backed by Green New Deal UK. We've got very close links, links with the UK school uh, strikers and we work very closely with them. And I think they're, they, they're represented on the board of Green New Deal UK as well. Organised workers, we need to embed this in the workplace. It's the place, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's the driving uh, the driver of people's experience of life is in the office um, for, for, for many people and we need to, we need to um, make this real to them there and, uh, and they're going to be a really important lobby um, uh, to drive the Green New Deal as well. And then organise communities, embedding ourselves where people are. People talk about council politics as being stuff that actually matters to people like potholes and things like that, but councils in the UK have declared climate emergencies. There's hundreds of councils in the UK who have declared a climate emergency. And to make that real, that's going to be the local matters that people care about over the next 10 years. And again, Julian, I think, will be able to talk more about how, what, what, that, what those sorts of plans will look like in local areas, in cities. So those are the three forces that we need. And how do and how will we get there? It'll require immense political will. We'll need to create and sustain it. And like I said, we'll need people power and political power. So the theory of change, and I'll just finish on, on, on this. We're developing local organizing hubs embedded in their communities, diverse. They'll build support locally for a Green New Deal. Well, they'll share resources, they'll educate people on what it means for their local area, they'll stimulate protest and campaigning and engagement with the political system that we need. We'll create high power, high profile mobilizations or, or actions um, that highlights the urgency of all of this and that will build the public support and get them to understand that what we mean by a Green New Deal is a, is a very radical prospect, a prospect that improves the lives of the majority of people. And that will build pressure within the parliament. And important to all of that is going to be to use storytelling. And I think Green New Deal is really, really focused on the imagery of the, the climate crisis and the inequality crisis and the solutions that we propose to. And I'll finish up here because I'm aware I've gone over time. But I just want to say that in, in the COVID context, I know this is going to be relevant, there's been a spin off campaign called Build Back Better. Uh, we've had a massive role in uh, bringing a huge group of organizations together around that concept. Um, that's in response to the COVID plan, no, to, to, to COVID, that's about, um, specifically for us, the, the, the climate jobs plan is going to be absolutely key here. Because like I said about fetishizing work, it's not so, not so important. Um, it, it's not much of an issue necessarily when unemployment is, is low, but over the next couple of uh, months, unemployment is going to skyrocket. And so for us, this campaign, Build Back Better, is going to be key to that. We've got loads of organisations signed up. But I'll finish there because I'm aware of one of the time. Thank you, Robert. Thank you so much uh, for uh, enlightening us. Uh, so as I said, I'm not going to, to make any Brexit jokes today, but uh, it's uh, really exciting to see what's going on um, in the UK. We are uh, being, as always, uh, run over by, by events, right? Uh, 
uh, they just published that uh, the economies of France, uh, Spain, and the UK are going to shrink 10% in the last, uh, in the next uh, uh, month. So let's see what happens. But without further ado, we are going to have the discussion uh, later uh, with Costanza moderating. I'm going to introduce Julian Saravo. Uh, Julian is an architect and urban designer working in the policy and think tank world. He coordinated the design and urban research work of the UK-based think tank uh, Commonwealth, a think tank that focuses on developing forms of democratic ownership and transforming how the economy operates and for whom. At Commonwealth, he is busy turning green policy into design questions. So I think that speaks to a lot of, uh, of the students of TU Delft uh, who are here today. Thank you so much for being here, Julian. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So let me share screen. Um, thank you for the introduction and thank you, Robert, for the, the little introductions. Um, can you all see my screen? Hopefully, yes. Right, so uh, my name is Julian. Um, I'm originally from Italy. I work here, I've been here in the UK for about 10 years. I work for a think tank uh, or two, actually. Um, uh, Commonwealth uh, is, um, is a think tank that c c concentrates on, on the future of ownership. Mainly, I, I would say that's, that's, that's how I tend to describe them. We've been around for about, for just over a year. Um, and I joined them for about since about half of that time. Um, so it's it's early days. It's exciting days for us. Um, and I'm going to talk very briefly about our blueprint for a Green New Deal. Robert already sort of uh, explained extensively the 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 sort of the most important points, uh, or at least those points that are also most important to us. Particularly the sort of the idea that it's not sort of just work, but it but it has to be good work. Um, reducing the working week. Uh, that's really important uh, both for C C C Commonwealth and for the other think tank I work for, which is called T T T Autonomy UK. They've been doing a lot of work around, for, around the four day week. Um, so I'm just gonna, I'm just going to sort of outline our different research streams uh, that we see as most important as part of the blueprint for a Green New Deal. Um, one is, is uh, finance and investment, uh, so that means green central banking. Um, another point that Sir Robert uh, brought up, um, really, which really means a step change um, in, in, in the way public investment operates, uh, and a domestication of private finance. Um, Point two is ownership and, and institutions. Uh, that means rethinking property arrangements, which is a particularly hot issue in the UK. Um, uh, sort of in, 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 in rebuilding a 21st century commons, um, reimagining the c c company form, um, and really taking um, taking the economy from a place of extraction to a place of stewardship. Um, point three, green internationalism. Also for us, uh, it's, been, it's been a really important point. Um, I think, you know, partially also because of Brexit and for other reasons, um, the sort of transatlantic connection has been, has been, has been really important, but um, we've been doing a lot of research on just sustainable sustainable and, and sort of globally coordinated trade. Um, international institutions that are ge geared uh, towards the, 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 the benefit of the global south. Um, and something that really embeds solidarity over ch 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 charity in, um, in, the way, in the way those things are done. Industrial strategy are a lot of the sort of green jobs and skills that Robert mentioned, uh, green industry, entrepreneurship and manufacturing, um, and really trying to find ways of democratizing innovation. We've been looking a lot uh, at the work 
uh, of IIPP and Mariana Matsukato in in uh, in that direction. So really, really making sure that innovation processes work uh, work uh, for all of us. Uh, and then obviously ecological and social regeneration. So so anything to do with uh, biodiversity and nature restoration. We have some great research going on about peatland restoration and we've been we've actually my my job is also has also been sort of to visualize some of those projects so go and check out the the, the interactive rewilding projects because they're, they're quite fun uh but also health health and social care and uh, and really a well-being economy um cities obviously sit at the intersection of all of these um and i've i've so far oops so far, um, the sort of biggest piece of work I've been working on uh, is called the Green New Deal City of 2030. Um, and the way I conceptualized it, or the way sort of I, I uh, my way into this and into the whole um, issue of the Green New Deal uh, has been sort of about rethinking scales of sharing. Uh, at what scale uh, do we start to, do we need to rethink ownership when we're talking about about an urban context, um, so so that includes um, that'll include really trying to place uh, what local finance is there to do, um, and really what are what are the parts of the economy and the market that we want to sort of start to pull into um, processes of public finance. Um, so in our in our interactive visualization, we had we had anything from housing projects to small markets to retail parks, which would all be part of of, um, of local social initiatives, um, and that would include also uh, uh, what we're calling a retrofitting revolution um, to really sort of bring down the the carbon consumption of each household, while at the same time addressing the huge issues of uh, fuel poverty um, that that uh, that the country uh, that this country in particular sees um, so that's really sort of getting into the nitty-gritty of, of appliances heat pumps solar panels um, and really thinking of those things uh, with a public mindset um, another scale of sharing um, sometimes municipal, sometimes um, at the neighborhood scale, um, are, are shared mobility solutions and local logistics. So anything from, from last mile car, car go um, to, um, to moving um, some of our some of our urban logistics back onto rail um, and bringing back um, sort of the ideas like trams, for example, which, uh, which have been left behind. Um, rethinking the scale of energy at, at which energy is owned and produced and bought. Um, this is something that we're thinking a lot about in a new project for Glasgow, where we're trying to really visualize uh, what a what a Green New Deal will mean there. Um, so, so it's really about getting um, unpacking the 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 complicated issue of of heat pumps for every building and and thinking about what 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 ownership structures can can um, can help in that direction um, and also thinking about what spaces in our neighborhoods can um, can enhance community well-being and be sort of reappropriated um, to fight issues also of urban long loneliness um, I guess in 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 a more gen general sense, um, we think that that a reorganization of the city 
uh, will need to be based on 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 reaggregating um, and sort of reinventing uh, urban subjects and confirmations. So that will also include um, rethinking where work is going to take place. Um, one of the sort of new normals that COVID is likely to bring is a lot more work from home. Uh, I think we should be thinking about whether work, whether it should just be work from home or whether we can think of solutions like work from community or work from neighborhood. Um, and and the effect uh, and the the effect it will have and the demands it will place uh, on our ground floors especially in the UK where so many neighborhoods are so heavily residential and low on services. Um, and I think this is an issue more sort of from the design point of view um, when, it, when it comes to sort of rethinking urban blocks. Um, it's really about, about uh, what can we share at the scale of the block uh, so anything from laundry um, to storage of food to sort of move beyond packaging, um, but also sort of turning our roofs into social spaces uh, with uh, with shared tools and shared furniture. So, and I guess this is really about green life styles, and it and it and it's sort of an extension of 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 the of the four day week uh, like what are we going to do with our three day weekends i guess is the is the question we're trying to answer here and you know how are we not going to get everybody to go to barcelona every every other every other week um, and it's really about creating cities that are that are geared for leisure for care uh, and for sociality rather than just for work uh, and consumption um, that's that's all for me. I, I thought I'd keep it brief so we could sort of open the discussion and maybe I could come back to some of these points. Thank you so much, Julian. Thank you very, very much. I'm, I'm, I'm going to give the word to, to Constanza very soon, but uh, I just wanted to uh, shout out to all the people from our, around the world that we have here today. People from Africa, our friends from Africa are here. Uh, there are quite a few people from South America, from Europe, from, from all over Europe. Uh, and uh, please, oh, from Argentina, look at that. Uh, if you want to say uh, where you are, please do so in the chat box. Uh, a shout out also to people from the summer school who, who are uh, special guests in this uh, talk. So hi guys, I see you all. Uh, but now we are, we are going to, I'm going to hand over to Constanza. Please. Thank you everybody. Uh, it was great. It's actually very promising to hear such different perspective from very different actors because we hear from the European perspective, which is, you know, it's like policy structure and it orients then the action of the member states. So it's very institutional in focus. And we heard from an activist perspective, which is also very important because you need to have, you know, this power from the bottom up that put pressures on the political world in order to enact those policies. And now we hear from a think tank that is like as an advisory role, an exploratory role of possible future on how to turn this policy in, in concrete actions from very small scale to bigger scale. So all of this is very, very interesting and promising also because of the alignment uh, across these different sectors. Uh, a question that I have, I, I actually have a question particularly um, for a, a um, for our guests that represent the European community. Because although today we are very focused on Europe, uh, a lot of European countries are important donors or important actors also in the global scene. And while I heard from uh, both the activist perspective and the think tank perspective from Julian, um, how there is, uh, let's say, an eye um, and how mm, what we do in a certain place as implication somewhere else and to this kind of internationalism and need to be coherent also, you know, when you are a donor, when, you, when you're an investor uh, somewhere else. How is the European Union thinking through this other branch of policy, you know, through their programs, through our uh, grants, through our third countries, developing countries and so on? 
Sander, this was yes. clearly for you. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much for the question. Um, I have to start by saying that uh, I this is not something that I work on personally. So obviously, uh, we have a lot of people in the European Commission who are working on development cooperation, also on trade and on, on, on external action in general. What I can say is that uh, because I am always at the table when, when initiatives like the European Green Oil Green Deal or the more specific uh, initiatives are being discussed um, at the level of, of the what we call the services or the the, the Directorate General. Um, if you have a chance of ever, because uh, I realize that you characterize uh, what I presented it as institutional, because it's of course institutional to a certain extent. Um, but I hope that also um, the people who are following these courses, I mean, uh, if they're interested that they take a look also at, at these uh, texts, you're right, they are to a certain extent aimed at uh, giving direction to more specific action mem of me at member state level, uh, uh, etc. But they are also often accompanied by proposals for um, legal initiatives. And this is not just uh, to give some kind of narrative, but it is, of course, uh, immediate uh, then binding law for a continent of almost 500 million people. But uh, what I wanted to say is if you have a chance of reading some of these uh, documents, you will see that each time there is a quite uh, significant international aspect. And so for the European Green Deal, it is really, really, this international aspect is really important. And it's also not, it's also framed in, to this extent, we aim to be the first climate neutral continent. But this is also because we want to show the world or the rest of the world uh, that it is possible to be climate neutral and to still be um, uh, to, to have a high level of well-being. Uh, I mean, you, you, read, you can read all day about problems that Europe is facing, but still it's a place in the world where a lot of people would like to live or, where, or that has a level of well-being that a lot of people would like to um, have as well. So it's a good place to be and we want to show the world that it is possible to be climate neutral and have a high uh, quality of life. And this is also why we are translating our European Green Deal ambitions in our trade policy, in our uh, development policy with a high uh, focus on Africa as well. Uh, if you want to know more specifically about, for instance, uh, the aspects related to biodiversity or circular economy, this is really quite well explained in, uh, in these documents. Um, but I'm sorry, it's not what I do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So the details I would, uh, yeah. Actually, it was a good, very good answer because the answer is you're going to lead by example, like changing the model of reference, which is actually also a very important part. Yes. And, and if I can perhaps add, so because I mentioned trade and development cooperation, um, which are just two aspects. Um, uh, one aspect that is a bit closer to my work is the neighborhood policy, because uh, in cohesion policy, where we have these investments for all regions, uh, some of the programs are also there for the neighboring countries. So the those who are candidate EU countries, but also the other neighboring countries. But what is also, of course, extremely important important is the power that the EU has through the EU single market, because if we adopt new um, standards for fuels or for vehicles or for aviation or for whatever, and this is all included in the European Green Deal, um, this is automatically applicable to anyone who wants to sell their products on the EU market which are many. So um, you can see if you, if you see graphs of, of, of these standards for vehicles, for instance, that the global market just follows the EU standards um, per definition, in fact. So this is also uh, one element related to this uh, leading by example. Thank you so much. Um, okay, I want to like, again, create a connection point. Uh, it emerged across all the different interventions that there is a strong focus on cities, obviously, because in the city we shape the, the culture of our society. In the city, there's a lot of cycle of consumption of production that takes place. In the city, there's a lot of manifestation of justice or injustice through the shape and the access that we give to the services and the neighborhood and so on. 
so this time my question is for Julian and it's about uh, what is exactly the role, the active role that a think tank like yours can play? Because normally you work as, a, as an advisor, no? either to government or to private sector. Um, so you wait for a client coming to you, but you produce so much wealth of knowledge. Uh, how can you actually leverage on this on a more broad platform? I'm unmuted, yes. <laughs> um, hi, thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, so I feel like one really important thing that we do is also build narratives. Uh, and that's, that's, that's also something that, uh, that Robert mentioned earlier. Uh, and that, that has been a huge part of, of my role at the think tank. Um, and the other thing that is that, um, a lot of, a lot of sort of our economy works, works also through core funding and through, let's say, building, building the tools that then activists can go and pick up, building the research that activists can go and pick up. So we, we will make a compelling case for a research stream um, and, 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 sort of, and sort of build that knowledge freely and independently, which is, which is really important here because it's, you, you, you know, money can kick you in one way, in one direction or the other. Um, so, so I'm not sure if I, whether I, whether I answered your question, but I think, I think there is what, what we're seeing increasingly is that, is that it is also good for, for, for us to demonstrate um, that, that we're just getting messages out there in the most compelling way possible. Um, and people are able to picking that up in an independent way. So, uh, whereas with direct leverage, um, it's, it's, um, that's, I guess, sort of what, 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 what we've traditionally done, which is, which is sort of having an ear, uh, in the office of of um, of this or that party, um, and then and then kind of picking up um, some of the research that uh, that you do. But I think sort of maintaining that independence is really important to keep agile. Thank you so much. This was very good, and also give me another link uh, for a question to Robert. Um, I actually appreciate very much uh, all uh, the way in which you're trying to build and leverage on activism to put political pressure, but also to build uh, knowledge and uh, consciousness about both, uh, you know, the problems and also the possible solutions and, and the needs to tackle them. And I ask at this point to you, uh, do you find value in collaborating, for instance, with uh, universities or think tank like um, the Commonwealth, uh, or you find yourself more on a position of, you know, um, let's say leverage as uh, um, the other, let's say, I don't know if it's clear, as the activist on the ground that is always pushing against or organizing the protests, or, or do you also have a proactive approach in terms of uh, creating projects, creating partnership with entities uh, like, institutions or a think tank or universities. I think it's very interesting to also understand what role activists can yeah. play in this. Yeah, definitely. No, um, absolutely. We lean on, on those organizations. So I, the fact that I referenced uh, Julian and, and Commonwealth's work um, at least twice in, in my talk shows, I think that they are essentially for us the, the, the policy people um, and a lot of people who are in Green New Deal UK, you know, some of us anyway, come from a policy minded background and we bring that uh, policy mindset to the table but really we know it's not our focus and so organisations that are prepared to really think big about the policy landscape who have connections with government possibly as well are really, really important to us. So. Um, there's an organization called the New Economics Foundation in, in the UK that we're really lucky to have. There's Commonwealth as well, and there's autonomy on, on work stuff. Um, and they, we really depend on them. And a lot of our um, original activists also came out of the NGO 
network, so Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth. But I would say that our relationship with them is that, so I've, I've worked for WWF, um, just, just briefly, but they, they rely on, on the Overton window being, you know, uh, as big as they need it to be. They, they, they can't go outside it, right? And it's not them who's going to widen it. They, they, they understand their role is we've got to work with the political reality that we work with. And, I, and I'm talking about NGOs in particular here. I think they have this um, attitude. Not so much Commonwealth or New Economics Foundation. I think they think a bit bigger. But the NGOs, they've got their funders to think about. They've got their donors. They've got their history. They've got their respectability. And all of those things are at the forefront of their minds. And so what we needed whenever I was in WWF was for that political space to get bigger. And then when the political space was bigger, we as an organization could start to move into it and we could start to radicalize our demands. And in the UK, you saw that happen really clearly in 2019, is that as soon as the school strikes started demanding for things, as soon as Extinction Rebellion started demanding for net zero by 2025, it became a hell of a lot more difficult for uh, Friends of the Earth to demand net zero by 2045 because suddenly that looks as ridiculous as it is. And so that was a really, really powerful thing. And yeah, so I, I say our role is to, to just create the space to, to move, well, whether, you, whether you move the Overton window, that would obviously be better, or, or, to, or to widen it. Widen. That's definitely our role. Thank you so much. I will now like, leave the, the space to the questions from the public, Roberto. Yeah, uh, I, I didn't know if you wanted to, to lead that as well, but um, uh, I can, I can uh, 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 throw a few questions. First of all, I just wanted to highlight the fact that uh, the three people uh, talking here today and Constanza are really great uh, role models for all of us and for all our students. And uh, I hope you look at them and say, okay, wow, this is something I could do, right? And this is important. I, I just wanted to highlight one thing that Robert highlighted in his presentation, which is the responsibility of the Green New Deal to recognize the injustices of the past, right? And uh, to, to look at, the, at how uh, Europe and uh, uh, the UK um, uh, also uh, through colonization exploited other, other countries. So how, how can we put this right, right? This is, um, very important uh, thing. But I, I just want to go um, to the questions and, um, and have a look at Kogela, for example. She is asking, um, how is cohesion policy allocated? Who decides where it goes? Does it go to the, to the poorest member of the, union, of, of the European Union? How does it work? Yes. Under, uh, I think. Yes, I, I will address this question and uh, at the same time also uh, address uh, Wilbert's question whom I think I'm sure I have met before um, on the quality of, of investments. So basically as I said EU cohesion policy is available for all EU regions um, so per definition but we have a, a system of distributing it that it goes more towards the we have basically a cat, threefold categorization of more developed transition and less developed regions. Uh, less developed regions means, uh, or in the future it will mean uh, below 100% of the average GDP per capita. And 75% of all the resources go to the less developed regions. So they really have um, massive resources. Uh, in the current period, just to give you an example, Poland has about 88 billion euros of EU investments over the seven year period, whereas uh, the Netherlands has maybe two or three hundred million or so. So this is this is how it is divided. Um, but it goes to all EU regions who decides where it goes exactly. So uh, the European Commission negotiates with member states or regions. This depends on the member states. So for instance, in Belgium, we don't talk to the Belgian federal government at all. So it's only the regions that we talk to. In a uh, country like Spain, we have a number of national programs uh, that cover the entire territory of Spain, and we have one program for 
each region specifically. So this really depends. Um, and we negotiate the programs with them where we decide in these programs, for instance, where the, the, the part of the money that goes to biodiversity and which kinds of projects they should be invested in which parts of the region, in the urban area, in the rural area, etc. So this is all uh, defined in those programs and we agree on them and the member states agree on them. Uh, and, and so I cannot give you a, a general answer. It is really specific to the needs and, and the characteristics of each territory. But as soon as we have the programs, and here I turn also to Wilbert's question, it is the member states who are as, as responsible, as long as they stay within the framework of, of what we have defined in the program, the member states are responsible for selecting projects and to decide whether they do it with calls or on, on direct uh, allocation uh, for public authorities, for instance. Um, and it's the member states who are responsible for deciding which specific projects are funded and how these projects should look like. So we can uh, say, for instance, in the program that projects on flood prevention should be uh, as a preference done with ecosystem-based approaches. This is something that you could read, for instance, in a program, but we cannot uh, top-down decide uh, the details of each program, we, uh, of each project. We don't have the competences for that. We don't have the people for that. Um, so you should imagine also that we have a budget over the seven years currently, for instance, about 350 billion euros. That's a whole lot of money. And we have only uh, basically a handful of people in, in the commission working on these programs. So it's really the bulk of the work happens at member state level. Um, and so they are also responsible for it. Um, to give you just a, a bit of an anecdote for the regulation of the next generation, so for the legal framework, the commission has proposed that we would be consulted on the project selection criteria. So so that means that when a member state has a call for a, a specific type of uh, projects in a specific region, they have to, of course, define what are the criteria for selecting projects. The Commission has proposed to be consulted on these criteria, so just to see them, and this was rejected by the Member States. So uh, this is also how the European Union works. The Commission proposes something, but uh, the Member States first have to accept that something can happen. I mean, if I can make a parallel, uh, a lot of things happened during the COVID crisis where the European Commission had no right to step in uh, when it comes to healthcare, for instance. So this is also the case of cohesion policy. We do not have the right to decide on the specific uh, projects. And, and uh, just to finish, for the next generation of programs, we are still waiting on the regulation to be uh, decided by the Parliament and the Member States, but we are already preparing these programs with the Member States. So we are already in what we call an informal dialogue with each Member State on how the, the programs should look like. Uh, and what they should fund with the with the money. If you are uh, in Europe and you are interested in what kind of projects there will be for the next uh, decade, let's say, of investments, it is uh, interesting to get in touch with the authorities in the member states and in the regions who are negotiating with us these programs, because uh, they are also um, they have a duty to include the relevant stakeholders. It's not only the national authorities that sit at the table with us, there is a partnership with stakeholders. So if you are interested in what your region or your member state is doing, uh, I would suggest that you get in touch with them. We are running a little bit out of time, so we have uh, 10 minutes left. Uh, let me just turn to uh, uh, Robert and, and, and Julian, because there is a very interesting question here about how do you produce uh, common, uh, the commons, how do you increase the commons in this uh, atmosphere of uh, fierce uh, neoliberalism and fierce uh, privatization? You think maybe COVID has uh, shed a new light on the commons? Yes, <laughs> certainly. Um, now, I think I think with with COVID, I think um, I think there are a couple of red herrings in terms of, for example, social distancing, uh, in terms of sort of uh, defining a new normal, uh, 
I, I don't think defining a new normal will be about sort of, you know, ensuring that everybody can maintain a certain distance. However, it is, it has, uh, it has brought up, uh, I, I think at least, at, at least here in London, um, the sort of deep inequalities in, in, um, in housing and in access to private green space, um, that, that has been, that has been massive, um, that, and, and, and it's, uh, it's like the opening and closing of parks has been an incredibly political, um, issue. Uh, and it's, and it's, and it's really sort of making health a public discussion and something which, which is an urban issue and which is, which is necessarily everybody else's problem which um, at least in this country, I think it was very easy until recently to frame health as uh, your individual fault. Um, whereas, whereas now sort of what is coming through is, is, is the maps. It's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's the hard um, sort of physical differences in the situations that that people are confronted with now um, that, that I think are necessarily making, making things that were sort of hidden as a non-commons, a commons again. Um, we've, we've been, we've been, I've been involved with some work with Hackney recently, which is a, which is a neighborhood here in London. It's a, it's a, it's a borough here of London and uh, all the, car removal plans are being considerably sped up um, because because shared space has has um, has has sort of been exposed as such I think it's uh, I think it's fabulous news <laughs> all right uh, Robert would you like to tip in with the Commons question? Yeah, sure. I, I think there is a there is a question on the commons in relation to finance. So I'll I'll, I'll mm -hmm. cover that aspect. Yeah. If that's okay. Sure. Sure. Well, yeah. The um yeah. So so the th three areas I see. So one area where the EU and some countries are doing quite well, and then two w which are more activist led. Um, well, one of them definitely act activist led, and the other needs national governments. Um, the first one is disclosures. So. Um, the, the, there's a task force on financial disclosures in the UK. What's really important is forcing companies to assess their climate impact as a company. And that means all three scopes. So they need to look not just at what they do in their factories, but also in the emissions related to the stuff that they use to produce the products that they make and the emissions, the emissions downstream as well and the ecological impact downstream as well. So that, for example, would mean not just assessing the emissions of, um, of you know, Ryanair's websites, but also the actual flights that people take as a result of Ryanair services. Um, on the second one would be divestment. So I was part of a divestment campaign at university. Um, that was a really powerful way of shifting finance um, in, in the public interest. Um, what that means is, is, is groups who campaign in their university, in their local council, um, even, even within businesses, in their pension funds, to drive the investments that all of those organizations have towards uh, companies that are acting in the public interest. Again, that's a really important uh, way of, of maneuvering finance. And then the third one is just public finance as well. So, um, that's the biggest distinction there is between the European Green Deal and the Green New Deal as a concept is that public finance is, a, is, a, is not a massive, relatively massive part of the European Green Deal, but it is a, part, is a massive part of every Green New Deal. And we have to accept that private finance is, is about finance. It's not about people. You can argue where that finance might go in the end downstream, but its raison d'etre is itself um, and that's what public finance, uh, that's where public finance differs because the return on some of these investments are going to be communal, they're going to be long term, they're going to be very positive, but a lot of them are going to come from the avoidance of extreme damage to people's livelihoods and societies, not necessarily the financial return that, that private finance expects. And so the growth driven nature 
of the European Green Deal, that's the massive differentiation between it and the Green New Deal. And I would say just, just on, on that, if I might, I've um, been speaking to people in the, in the Irish uh, Greens at the weekend because they are faced with the option of going into government with a programme for government that is um, being lauded uh, by, by a lot of people for being potentially one of the most ambitious programmes for government in Europe. Um, but they're not sure. Some of these candidates that I spoke to, uh, they, the, the Green candidates are saying, I told people in my community that climate policies, that green politics wasn't for wealthy people. It's not just for wealthy people. It is, you know, people driven, but it benefits and, and it benefits everyone. And they fear that the Green New Deal, they've actually been cheeky enough to call it the Green New Deal, which I was grateful that the EU didn't go that far to call it new. But in the Ireland plan, they did call it the Green New Deal doesn't have that front and center. It has, as Julian says, massive amounts of investment in cycling, for example, there's a huge amount of money there. Um, but in terms of ensuring that all around the country, including in rural areas, and I know this is, this is urban focus, but including rural areas, that the infrastructure is coming at the same time as the potential pain that might come along as a result of the other policies that need to accompany um, a Green New Deal and, and carbon tax is an example of that. But you have to be able to marry the two so that it benefits people right from the start and people can recognize that it's in their interests. Yeah, I think the idea that the Green Deal is for uh, rich people who, you know, uh, who drink cappuccinos is completely wrong. And we should com combat that idea very much. Look, we are getting, getting close to, uh, to the end of our webinar. Unfortunately, we won't have time to answer all the questions, but I would like to, uh, to ask Constanza to make a few uh, last remarks. You have to unmute yourself. Sorry, I thought that it was. <laughs> Uh, as I mentioned before, I think it was a great to have this three different but very aligned perspective. And I think what we're seeing globally is the raise of uh, an awareness from more and more parts of society, including academia. Uh, Roberto is a testimony of this. <laughs> um, and this is, I think, very promising because obviously uh, a Green New Deal, an active Green New Deal and transforming structurally how our society works, our, how our city, uh, our design and work, our value system, uh, both through financial mechanisms or through policies that force uh, the beginning and then maybe through incentives or other mechanisms, uh, reshape the, the ways in which economy work, services work and so on. I think this is uh, incredible and we all need to keep pushing because it's a very uh, intensely, intensively global issue and global effort. At all scale, uh, everybody needs to be engaged and I'm very happy particularly that the universities, academia is starting to be engaged also in teaching already, um, embedding this thinking in, into the also basic courses of the first year. My, my husband uh, teaches here in South Africa. They have a course that is building sustainability, which is an introductory called course. And although it's called building because it's within architecture, it's not uh, only tackling the building industry or the act of building and the construction, but it's about uh, building a thinking about what sustainability really means and how many spheres of life are impacted by this, uh, which obviously is the basic for any kind of uh, Green New Deal. But what I think is very important, the last uh, point, and it's what actually affects the professionals like uh, Julian, uh, me, Roberto, that work with the built environment, is this uh, emerging trend in rethinking what a city is. That is not something totally alien from the environment, is not the, you know, originally cities were walled to kind of define their diversity from what was outside that, that was the nature or the natural environment. But now our cities are everywhere. We have been speaking already for like almost 20 years of global urbanization. So uh, what is the role that city have, not just specially, but also in changing the way we see the world and we see the relationship of our society with the natural world. This is fundamental. Oops, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we really need to finish in a few moments, but uh, 
Caroline, Igor, Luz, Anya, do you have any final words or final observations? They have been silent. Otherwise, I don't, uh, yeah. No, I think that we can. Uh, we, we can. can okay. Yes, we are a bit late. So. Uh, look. Uh, Just thank everyone for, for yes, participating. We are such a diverse crowd today. Yeah, today it was a really diverse crowd. It's really super heartwarming. We are super happy. Uh, thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone. Uh, please uh, realize uh, you are part of our community. Uh, and uh, obviously, we are going to uh, keep in touch with you and uh, with our uh, other events. We are uh, constantly discussing uh, developments in the Global South. And uh, just to, uh, to respond to, to, to Constanza, we are teaching spatial justice at TUDELF. So uh, spatial justice is a cousin of uh, environmental justice. And uh, uh, yeah, we, we intend to, to keep on doing that. Now, our uh, uh, very honorable speakers, uh, Julian, Robert, Sander, thank you so very much for, for being here today with us. Costanza, our admirable uh, moderator, thank you so much for, for helping thank us. You. And as I say every time, there is no good way to finish a Zoom meeting. It's just horrible. Uh, <laughs> we, we don't have a way to... to, to um, to finish, so I thank you everyone for being here today, and I uh, will see you next time. Cheers. See you. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you.